Hi, I'm Allie Ward, Editorial Director of Contagion, and joining me today is Dr. Sarah Jorgensen, an antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist with Sinai Health System in Toronto. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with Contagion today. To start off, I wanted to ask you to explain sort of what your day-to-day -day was like prior to COVID and what it's like now in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so I think, you know, like most people working in hospitals, everything has sort of shifted focus to, uh, to preparing for and then uh, dealing with COVID. Um, and, you know, like most people, I think Zoom calls and meetings have um, become part of my kind of daily routine. I'm unfortunately still that person that, um, that you know, talks for five minutes with a muted microphone. So um, I think, you know, hopefully uh, I'll, uh, I'll get the uh, proper Zoom etiquette before this is all over, but um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're all feeling those tech issues. Um, you recently authored a review of the pharmacology of remdesivir. Um, what is it about the biochemistry and the pharmacokinetics of this antiviral that make it an attractive therapeutic option for treating COVID? Yeah, so um, it's a really kind of neat molecule. Um, so it's called a monophosphoramidate uh, nucleoside analog prodrug. So what it does is it, um, it competes with our endogenous nucleotides to get incorporated into the viral RNA. And um, it was originally developed uh, in response to the Ebola outbreak back in, in 2014, but was found to have um, really good activity, at least in vitro against, you know, a broad range of coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so for nucleotide analogs to be active, they have to get triphosphorylated, so that's adding three phosphate groups. And adding that first phosphate group is what really slows things down. Um, so remdesivir actually has a, the phosphoramidate group, which is sort of like a mask phosphate group, um, so that it hides until it penetrates into the cell, and then it gets unmasked and can quickly add those two more phosphate groups. So it kind of has a, a jump start um, on being active, and then it's good to go. Um, another thing with nucleoside analogs uh, against coronaviruses in general, is that they've really been hindered by a viral enzyme called, um, I'll just call it XON, so I don't get tongue-tied, but um, this enzyme goes along and it proofreads the growing RNA chain and takes out errors, which includes those analogs. And so remdesivir is actually partly able to evade this enzyme, and it does this through kind of two mechanisms. So first, it gets incorporated into the RNA chain really quickly, actually more efficiently than even our own endogenous nucleotides. And then the other reason is um, when it does get incorporated, uh, three more of our endogenous nucleotides get incorporated after it, and those kind of serve to protect it from the, from the enzyme that wants to splice it out. So that's why we think, at least in vitro, that it seems to, to be pretty potent and, um, and evade a lot of these things that have hindered uh, previous nucleoside analogs. And what about the safety profile of remdesivir? Yeah, so I think we're, we're learning about that really quickly. Um, in, the, in the phase one studies and in also some of the, um, the Ebola studies and then the compa compassionate use, I think one thing that we saw kind of consistently were these elevations in transaminase enzymes, um, even in healthy volunteers, but it doesn't seem to have panned out in the two RCTs that, that we've seen so far. I mean, they were underpowered really to detect. Um, serious liver abnormalities, but that has been reassuring that we're not seeing major problems, at least so far, with that regard. Are there any concerns of eventually developing resistance with this drug? Yeah, you know, so I think that's still an open book. Um, it has been found to occur in in vitro, um, in vitro studies, but we still don't really have anything in human yet. Um, you know, I think we know from kind of chronic viral infections that we tend to need um, 
kind of cocktails of drugs to prevent resistance development. But this is really the first drug that's shown any meaningful benefit for an acute viral pneumonia. So it's, it's really unknown territory in terms of, of how we need to be using these, whether it's okay to do monotherapy or, um, or combination therapy or how quickly resistance can develop. Right. Um, we did get some data this week on remdesivir, um, preliminary data from the NIH study, and also about a five versus a 10 day dose. Um, are you encouraged by some of these data that we saw this week? Yeah, so I think before the ACTT1 study, the data was really hard to interpret. So we had that, um, that compassionate use report in New England Journal, the 61 patients, but no control arm. Um, and then the study in China by Wang and colleagues came out, but had to stop early, so didn't reach its target enrollment and kind of left us with inconclusive results. So it was great to see um, the ACTT study finally come out. And I think this was a really solid study um, to enroll over a thousand patients from like, I think it was 60 sites globally in just a couple of months in the middle of a pandemic is really a pretty tremendous accomplishment. Um, and as I said before, this is the first time that we've actually seen a drug provide meaningful benefit for a viral pneumonia. So I think the, the odds were kind of stacked against it to start with. Um, that said, you know, the benefit, it was pretty modest, um, and the outcome, although it, it does, you know, seem very objective, there is still some subjectivity in um, deciding on oxygenation and when to discharge patients. So um, I do think it was really a shame that it, was, that it was stopped early. You know, they had enrolled all of the patients, and a couple more weeks, and we would have, you know, perhaps had more conclusive uh, results around the mortality. Um, I think at this point, we, um, we see that it hastens time to recovery, but without the full data, we don't know if it is helping patients recover who wouldn't have otherwise recovered, or if it is just more accelerating um, time to recovery in those who, who really would have anyway, which is valuable, especially in overstressed healthcare systems, but um, you know, it would have been really nice to, to have the full results. Um, be able to be analyzed. Um, and this is one study too, so I think to, to really be more sure about, um, about its, its efficacy, we do need to see it replicated. But fortunately, there's you know, many other RCTs still going on, so, um, so you know, looking forward to those. And also the, the kind of the second arm of the ACTT study, um, adding baricitinib. Um, you know, I think that should be really interesting to see how that plays out because we know that in more severe patients, it seems like it's more of the um, a hyperimmune response that is, is underlying a lot of the, the um, acute organ failure that we're seeing. So um, maybe adding one of those on um, could, uh, could provide some benefit, although it's, it's, it's still a tricky balance because, um, you know, exactly when to add it. Um, and uh, not cause problems with hindering viral clearance is, is tough too, so. Definitely. Um, I mean, you've done a, a deep dive pharmacologically on this drug. What is the most important thing that you think clinicians need to know about it? I think, um, I think knowing that at this point, it, it doesn't seem to be, um, to be kind of the panacea for, for the illness, especially since we, you know, we didn't see a huge benefit in those most severely ill patients. So we don't know if this is just because those groups were smaller or if it's, it's really, um, you know, need something more powerful or a different mechanism at that point. Um, I think, you know, being vigilant um, and monitoring for any safety signals, you know, it's still not a whole lot of patients that have been exposed to it yet. So um, that's still kind of an evolving field. Your work focuses on antimicrobial stewardship. Um, what sorts of opportunities to practice stewardship have you observed in this climate of COVID? Um, I think that uh, it's really been, you know, kind of information gathering and providing education. There's just um, kind of a ton of, of data and uh, studies coming out all of the time and, and preprints have kind of um, made it into the forefront for the first time. So it's really fishing through that and, and picking out what, um, 
you know, what can help inform practice and, and what's good science and, and, and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. So in, and in terms of stewardship, I think it's, um, it's been kind of tough because when patients present with uh, acute respiratory um, infection, you don't know at the time whether it's bacterial or viral. And so, um, you know, a lot of patients still are getting empiric antibiotics and it's knowing um, when and if you can, you can peel those off. Uh, the whole um, patient population for us has, has kind of changed too because a lot of um, elective procedures have been, have been postponed and, and, you know, we see a lot of usually hemoc patients. So um, some of their treatment is, has been postponed too. So um, infections in those patients are, uh, are not as prevalent, but we're, um, of course, you know, picking up instead a lot of COVID patients. Yeah. Great. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Just to stay tuned, I guess, for um, for what's coming up. And I think there's a, a lot of exciting work going on and, and just the speed and, uh, you know, with the randomized controlled trials that are they're getting up and going is, is pretty amazing. And uh, so that should be exciting. I know that um, we're starting up several um, at our hospital as well. So um, it'll be interesting to see how those, those play out too. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Okay, thanks for, uh, thanks for speaking with me.